The New Man, an interpretation of some parables and miracles of Christ by Maurice Nicole. Chapter 1, The Language of Parables, Part 1. All sacred writings contain an outer and an inner meaning. Behind the literal words lies another range of meaning, another form of knowledge. According to an old age tradition, man once was in touch with this inner knowledge and inner meaning. There are many stories in the Old Testament which convey another knowledge, a meaning quite different from the literal sense of the words. The story of the ark, the story of Pharaoh's butler and baker, the story of the Tower of Babel, the story of Jacob and Esu and the mess of pottage, and many others containing an inner psychological meaning far removed from their literal level of meaning. And in the Gospels, the parable is used in a similar way. Many parables are used in the Gospels. As they stand, taken in the literal meaning of the words, they refer apparently to vineyards, to householders, to stewards, to spendthrift sons, to oil, to water and to wine, to seeds and sowers and soil and many other things. This is their literal level of meaning. The language of parables is difficult to understand just as it is, in general, the language of all sacred writings. Taken on the level of literal understanding, both the Old and New Testaments are full not only of contradictions, but of cruel and repulsive meaning. The question arises, why are these so-called sacred writings cast in misleading form? Why is not what is meant explained clearly? If the story of Jacob's supplanting of Esu, or again of the Tower of Babel, or of the ark constructed in three stories riding on the flood, is not literally true but has a quite different inner meaning, why is it all not made evident? Why again should parables be used in the Gospels? Why not say directly what is meant? And if a person thinking in this way were to ask why the story of creation in Genesis, which clearly cannot be taken literally, means something else, something quite different from what the literal words mean, he might very well conclude that the so-called sacred writings are nothing but a kind of fraud deliberately perpetuated on mankind. If all these stories, allegories, myths, comparisons and parables in sacred scripture mean something else, why can it not be stated clearly what they mean from the starting point so that everyone can understand? Why veil everything? Why all this mystery, this obscurity? The idea behind all sacred writing is to convey a higher meaning than the literal words contain, the truth of which must be seen by man internally. This higher, concealed, inner or esoteric meaning, cast in the words and sense images of ordinary usage, can only be grasped by the understanding. And it is exactly here that the first difficulty lies in conveying higher meaning to man. A person's literal level of understanding is not necessarily equal to grasping psychological meaning. To understand literally is one thing, to understand psychologically is another. Let us take some examples. The commandment says, thou shalt not kill. This is literal. But the psychological meaning is, thou shalt not murder in thy heart. The first meaning is literal, the second meaning is psychological and is actually given in Leviticus. Again, the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, is literal, but the psychological meaning, which is more than this, refers to mixing different doctrines, different teachings. That is why it is often said that people went whoring after other gods and so on. Again, the literal meaning of the commandment, thou shalt not steal, is obvious, but the psychological meaning is far deeper. To steal, psychologically, means to think that you do everything from yourself, by your own powers, not realising that you do not know who you are, or how you think or feel, or even how you even move. It is, as it were, taking everything for granted and ascribing everything to yourself. It refers to an attitude. But if a man were told this directly, he would not understand. So the meaning is vowed, because if it were expressed in literal form, no one would believe it, 
and everyone would think it mere nonsense. The idea would not be understood and worse still, it would be taken as ridiculous. Higher knowledge, higher meaning, if it falls on the ordinary level of understanding, will even seem nonsense or it will be wrongly understood. It will then become useless and worse. Higher meaning can only be given to those who are close to grasping it rightly. This is one reason why all sacred writings, that is, writings that are designed to convey more than the literal sense of the words, must be concealed, as it were, by an outer wrapping. It is not a question of misleading people, but a question of preventing this higher meaning from falling in the wrong place, or lower meaning, and thereby having its finer significance destroyed. People sometimes imagine they can understand anything once they are told it, but this is quite wrong. The development of the understanding, the seeing of differences, is a long process. Everyone knows that little children cannot be taught about life directly because their understanding is small. Again, it is realised that there are subjects in ordinary life that cannot be understood save by long preparation, such as certain branches of the sciences. It is not enough to be merely told what they are about. The object of all sacred writings is to convey higher meaning and higher knowledge in terms of ordinary knowledge as a starting point. The parables have an ordinary meaning. The object of the parables is to give a man higher meaning in terms of lower meaning in such a way that he can even think for himself or not. The parable is an instrument devised for this purpose. It can fall on a man literally or it can make him think for himself. It invites him to think for himself. A man first understands on his ordinary matter of fact or natural level. To lift the understanding, whatever is taught must first fall on this level to some extent to form a starting point. A man must get hold of what he is taught to begin with in a natural way. But the parable has meaning beyond its literal or natural sense. It is deliberately designed to fall first on the ordinary level of the mind and yet to work in the mind in the direction of lifting the natural level of comprehension to another level of meaning. From this point of view, a parable is a transforming instrument in regard to meaning. As we shall see later, the parable is also a connecting medium between a lower and a higher level in development of the understanding. Part 2. The Gospels speak mainly of a possible inner evolution called rebirth. This is their central idea. Let us begin by taking inner evolution as meaning a development of the understanding. The Gospels teach that a man living on this earth is capable of undergoing a definite inner evolution if he comes in contact with definite teachings on this subject. For that reason, Christ said, I am the way and the truth and the life. John 14, 6 This inner evolution is psychological. To become a more understanding person is a psychological development. It lies in the realms of the thoughts, the feelings, the actions and in short, the understanding. A man is his understanding. If you wish to see what a man is and not what he is like, look at the level of his understanding. The Gospels speak then of a real psychology based on the teaching that man on earth is capable of a definite inner evolution in understanding. The Gospels are from beginning to end all about this possible self-evolution. They are psychological documents. They are about the psychology of this possible inner development, that is, about what a man must think, feel and do in order to reach a new level of understanding. The Gospels are not about the affairs of life, save indirectly, but about this central idea, namely that man, internally, is a seed capable of a definite growth. Man is compared with a seed capable of a definite evolution. As he is, man is incomplete, unfinished. A man can bring about his own evolution, his own completion, individually. If he does not wish to do this, he need not. He is then called grass that is burned up as useless. This is the teaching of the Gospels. 
But this teaching can be given neither directly nor by external compulsion. A man must begin to understand for himself before he can receive it. You cannot make anyone understand by force, by law. But why cannot this teaching be given directly? We come again to the question, why cannot higher meaning be given in plain terms? Why all this obscurity? Why these fairy stories? Why these parables and so on? Everyone has an outer side that has been developed by his contact with life and an inner side which remains vague, uncertain, undeveloped. Teaching about rebirth and inner evolution must not fall only on the outer side of a man, the life-developed side. Some people reach a stage where they realise that life does not satisfy them, where they generally begin to look in other directions and seek different aims, before they can hear any teaching of an order similar to that of the Gospels. The outer side of a man is organised by life and its demands, and is according to his position and capacities. In a sense, it is artificial, it is acquired. But it is only the inner, unorganised side of a man which can evolve as does a seed by its own growth from itself. For that reason, the teaching of inner evolution must be so formed that it does not fall solely on the outer side of a man. It must fall there first, but be capable of penetrating more deeply and awakening the man himself, the inner, unorganised man. A man evolves internally through his deeper reflection, not through his outer life-controlled side. He evolves through the spirit of his individual understanding and by inner consent to what he sees as truth. The psychological meaning of the relatively fragmentary teaching recorded in the Gospels refers to this deeper inner side of everyone. Once one can comprehend that a man can evolve only through a growth in his own individual and so inner understanding, one can see that if a true teaching about the meaning of inner evolution falls solely on the outer side of a man, it will be useless, or will even appear to him as so much nonsense. It may, in fact, be destroyed by falling on the wrong place in him, on his business side, his worldly side. He will then trample it underfoot. This is the meaning of Christ's remark, Neither cast your pearls before swine, lest haply they trample them under their feet. Matthew, chapter 7, verse 6. Under means the outer life side of a man, the lowest side of a man's understanding, the side which only believes in what his senses show him, the side of the mind which touches the earth as do the feet. This side cannot receive the teaching of inner evolution because it is turned outwards and not inwards. This side, therefore, cannot understand about rebirth. A man has one birth naturally, or esoteric teaching says that he is capable of a second birth. But this rebirth, or second birth, belongs to the man in himself, the private secret man, the internal man, not to the man as he seems to be in life and thinks himself to be, the successful man, the pretended man. All the latter belongs to the outer man, what the man appears to be, not what the man is inwardly. It is the inward man that is the side of rebirth. In the psychological teaching of the Gospels, a man is not taken as what he appears to be, but as what he most deeply is. This is one reason why Christ attacked the Pharisees, for they were appearances. They appeared to be good, just, religious and so on. In attacking the Pharisees, he was attacking that side of a man that pretends, that keeps up appearances for the sake of outer merit, fear, praise, the man who in himself is perhaps even rotten. The Pharisee, psychologically understood, is the outer side of a man who pretends to be good, virtuous and so on. It is that side of yourself. This is the Pharisee in every man and this is the psychological meaning of Pharisee. Everything said in the Gospels, whether represented in the form of parable, miracle or discourse, has a psychological meaning, apart from the literal sense of the words. Therefore, the psychological meaning of the Pharisee refers not to certain people who lived long ago, but to oneself now, to the Pharisee in oneself, to the insincere person in oneself who, of course, cannot receive any real and genuine psychological teaching without turning it into an occasion for merit 
praise and award. Later on we will study the meaning of the Pharisee in oneself more fully. Part 3 Since all sacred writings contain both a literal and a psychological meaning, they can fall in a double way on the mind. If man were capable of no further development, this would have no sense. It is just because he is capable of a further individual evolution that parables exist. The sacred idea of man, that is the esoteric or inner idea, is that he possesses an unused higher level of understanding and that his real development consists in reaching this higher possible level. So all sacred writings, as in the form of parables, have a double meaning because they contain a literal meaning designed to fall on the level of a man as he is, and at the same time they can reach up to the higher level potentially present in him and await in him. A parable is cast in the form of ancient meaning. A parable in the Gospels is cast in the form of an ancient language now forgotten. There was a time when the language of parables could be understood. This language, the language of the parable, allegory and miracle, is lost to the humanity of today. But sources still remain which enable us to understand something of this ancient meaning. Since the object of the parable is to connect higher and lower meanings, it can be thought of as a bridge between two levels, a liaison between literal and psychological understanding. And, as we shall see, a definite language was once well known in which this double rendering was understood and certain words and terms deliberately used in an understood double sense. Through this ancient language, a connection was made between higher and lower meaning, or which is the same, the higher and lower sides of man. Our first birth is from the world of cells by evolution into that of man. To be reborn or born again means to evolve up to a higher psychology, a higher possible level of understanding. This is man's supreme aim, according to the teaching of all ancient scriptures in which man is regarded, psychologically, as an undeveloped seed. And this is esoteric teaching. This level can only be reached by new knowledge and the feeling and practice of it. And the knowledge that gives a man this possibility is sometimes called, in the Gospels, truth, or sometimes the word. But it is not ordinary truth or ordinary knowledge. It is knowledge about this further step in development. Let us try to gain some preliminary ideas about this ancient double language of parables. Let us begin by studying how truth is represented. In this ancient language, visible things represent psychological things. Outer life, registered by the senses, is transformed into another level of meaning. Now truth is not a visible object, but it was represented by means of a visible object in this language. A parable is full of visible imagery of the objects of the senses. But each visual image represents something belonging to a psychological level of meaning distinct from the image used. In the Gospels, the word water is often used. What does this word mean in the ancient language? In the literal sense of the word, it means the physical substance called water. But psychologically, on a higher level of meaning, it has a different import. Water does not mean simply water. Christ, in speaking of rebirth to Nicodemus, says that a man must be born of water and the spirit. Except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. John, chapter 3, verse 5. What then does water mean? It must have another meaning, a psychological or higher meaning. We might guess, perhaps, that the Spirit means possibly the will or the inmost, most real part of a man. And we might understand that to be born again does not literally mean to enter the womb of the mother again, as Nicodemus thought, who stands for a man capable only of literal understanding. Whatever we may think about the meaning of spirit, we cannot imagine without ordinary comprehension what water means in this ancient double-sided language in which things of the senses convey another and special meaning. There is no clue. To say that a man must be born again of physical water is sheer nonsense. What then does water mean psychologically? We can find by means of other passages in the Bible 
what this physical image represents on the psychological level of meaning. A hundred examples might be quoted. Let us take one from the Gospels. Christ spoke to the woman of Samaria by the wellside and told her he could give her living water. Christ says to her when she has come to draw water at the well, Everyone that drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. John chapter 4 verses 13 to 14 It is plain that water is being used in a special sense, belonging to this ancient forgotten language. Again in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, it is said, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out of cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 what then is this water, this living water? In the ancient language, water means truth, but it means a special kind of truth, a special form of knowledge called living truth. It is living truth because it makes a man alive in himself and not dead, once the knowledge of it is assented to and applied in practice. In esoteric teaching, that is, teaching about inner evolution, a man is called dead who knows nothing about it. It is knowledge that is true only in reference to the reaching of this higher level of inner evolution awaiting everyone. It is knowledge about this higher level of man and leading to it. It refers to what a man must know, think, feel and understand and do to reach his next stage of development. It is not outer truth about outer things, outer objects, but inner truth about the man himself and the kind of person he is and how he can change himself. It is therefore esoteric truth, esoteric meaning inner, or truth referring to that inner development and new organisation of a man that leads to his next step in real evolution. For no one can change, no one can become different, no one can evolve and reach this higher possible level and so be reborn unless he knows, hears and follows a teaching about it. If he thinks he knows truth of this order by himself, then he is like those mentioned above who forsake the living waters and hew out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The idea is quite plain. A teaching exists and has always existed that can lead to a higher development. This teaching is the real psychological teaching in regard to man and the possible development of the new man in him. Man cannot invent it by himself. He can hew it out cisterns for himself, but they hold no water. That is no truth. When there is no truth of this order, the state of man is sometimes compared with thirst. The poor and needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst. Isaiah 41 verse 17 Or when people follow wrong truth about a comparison is sometimes made with drinking bitter waters or with undrinkable or polluted water. Let us now apply this idea of water meaning truth in this ancient language to one of the sayings of Christ and realise what psychological meaning is, in contrast to a literal meaning. Christ said, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only, in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no ways lose his reward. Matthew chapter 10 verse 42 here, a literal-minded person will think that all that is necessary is to give a cup of cold water to a child. But if water means truth, then the phrase refers to the handing on of truth, however poorly. And little one here does not mean a child in the Greek, but a person small in understanding. Let us also notice that to receive truth, the mind must be like a cup, which receives what is poured into it. That is, a man must be ready and willing to be taught, so that his mind is like a cup to receive water. So the phrase given a cup of water refers both to receiving truth and handing it on to others. All this cannot be logically expressed, but it can be psychologically understood. And this is exactly the intention of the ancient language we have begun to study. Part 4 
Other words for truth are used in the esoteric writings of the Old and New Testaments. Water is not the only image used to represent the order of truth that we are studying. In the ancient language, stone and wine are both used as images for this form of truth, but on different scales of meaning. Stone represents the most external and literal form of esoteric truth. It represents esoteric truth in its most inflexible sense. The commandments were written on tables of stone. It must be understood the truth about a higher evolution must rest upon a firm basis for those incapable of seeing any deeper meaning. Let us take briefly the extraordinary story of the Tower of Babel recorded in Genesis. The ideas centred in this story refer to man trying by his ordinary knowledge to reach a higher level of development. This is the meaning of the tower that was built by man. But from what has been said so far, it can be realised that to reach a higher level for a man personally or for mankind, the teaching of the knowledge necessary for this further step must be known and be followed. Man cannot add to this stature by taking thought, that is, his own ideas, his own thoughts, cannot bring him up to a new level of evolution. He must submit to a teaching. His efforts must be based on this truth that we are studying. And this special knowledge, or esoteric truth, at its lowest level of comprehending, is called stone. We shall see what the Tower of Babel was built of in regard to this necessary knowledge called truth. It was not stone, and it is expressly said that it was not so. That is, it did not come from a higher level of man, from those who have become new men. The story of the Tower of Babel is very strange and has little meaning if we take it literally. It begins by saying that once upon a time, after the days of Noah and the ark, all people had a common knowledge, and the whole of earth was of one language and one speech. Genesis chapter 11 verse 1. Then it is said that they journeyed from the east, i.e. away from truth, and came to a plain and began to think of building a tower to reach to heaven. Notice how the account continues. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name. Notice that they travelled from the east, and they had brick, a man-made thing, and not stone. The east represents, in the ancient language of parables, the source of esoteric truth. They reached a plain, that is, came down from a higher level, and then began to think that they could of themselves do something, apart from what knowledge of truth they had gained from the east. So they began to build a tower, that is, they thought that they could, out of their own ideas and thoughts, reach to the highest level, here called heaven, and also called similarly in the gospel language. Heaven means a higher level of man, and earth means an ordinary man, the natural man. They begin to build for themselves, but notice that it is expressly said that they not only had bricks for stone, but slime for mortar. A higher level cannot be understood by a lower level. A man on a higher level cannot be understood by a man on a lower level. Man as he is cannot reach a higher level unless he comes into possession of the knowledge, called truth, that can lead him to it. So the tower was a failure, and in the strange way in which this ancient language puts things, it looks as if God scattered them out of jealousy. But one must look deeper to understand this language. Man was at fault, not God. Man tried to raise himself by his own knowledge, called here brick and slime, and so was shattered. The following is Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 to 9. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, 
and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. But it is very difficult to understand the ancient language if we take it literally. We can understand that if an engineer makes some part of an engine that is wrongly measured out or of the wrong material, his engine will be no good. He may say, it is God's fault. It is not God punishing. It is a wrong request and so the response will not be as he hoped. The response will be according to the quality of his request. And this is God or if you like, the universe that science studies. A wrong request leads to a wrong response. It is not really a wrong response, but an exactly right response in view of the request. The parable of the Tower of Babel is an illustration of this. Man made a tower out of brick and slime in place of stone and mortar. And God said, that is, response to requests, said, this cannot be, in so many words. Now let us look at other examples of stone as a term meaning in the ancient language. Truth about a higher development. To reach a higher state of himself, a man must request rightly, and for this to come about, a man must know what to ask for. Christ says, ask and ye shall receive. But unless we know something about either the stone or the water of esoteric knowledge, how can we know what to ask for? Christ is not speaking about asking for life things, but about asking for help in inner evolution and understanding. Certain requests are made in the Lord's Prayer. They are about right asking, but we will study this later. Now let us take the strange incident of Christ renaming Simon. Simon means a hearing, but Christ renamed Simon Peter, which in the Greek is stone. Christ, of course, represents this truth of which we are speaking. He called himself the truth. He spoke of a high level of evolution for each individual man. He taught the means of attaining it. He taught rebirth. Now in renaming Simon as Peter, he referred to the literal aspect of his teaching. Christ said to Simon, Thou art Peter, and upon this stone I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 16, verses 18 to 19. Simon Peter was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Heaven means psychologically this higher level of development, intrinsically possible for man. But Christ only gave Peter, as the stone, the keys. The commandments written on stone are keys also. But literally taken, they are not enough. They open into psychological meaning. They contain great internal meaning. Esoteric truth in the form of stone is not flexible enough to lead to any real inner development. It must be understood, not merely followed blindly. In Genesis it is said that Jacob rolled away the stone from the well. The stone in the mouth of the well means in the ancient language the literal truth blocks the psychological understanding of it. The stone was rolled back and the flock watered, for water is the psychological understanding of literal esoteric truth called stone. In this way can the following passage be understood. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the children of the east, and he looked, and behold, a well in the field, and lo, three flocks of sheep lying there by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks, and the stone upon the well's mouth was great, and thither were all the flocks gathered, and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep. Genesis 29 verses 1 to 3 When a stone blocks the well, it means that people have taken esoteric truth literally in the sense of the words only. They prefer rituals and so on. They literally do not kill, but see no reason why they should not murder in their hearts. 
Christ himself, who represented esoteric truth or the way or the word, was called the stone which the builders rejected. The psalmist says, the stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. Psalm 118 verse 22. This is a strange phrase. Who are the builders? The builders of what? Of this world? Certainly Christ's teaching came into a world built of violence, a world in which everyone believed that violence leads to something better. But when Christ is called the stone, it means that fundamentally he was so. His whole teaching, however, was to transform stone into water and finally water into wine. The Jews understood everything literally as stone. Christ transformed literal into psychological meanings. This is shown in one of the miracles, which are really psychological miracles, that is, the transformation of literal meaning into psychological understanding. A man who is bound down to the literal meaning of higher truth can destroy himself. This explains, perhaps, why some religious people seem to be destroyed by their contact with religion and made worse than life would make them. This is possibly shown in the account in the fifth chapter of Mark of the man with an unclean spirit who came out of the tombs, of whom it is said that he was always cutting himself with stones. Stones, that is, taking higher truth at a literal level, cut him, made him unclean. And since Jesus represented, let us say at present, a higher understanding of literal truth, the man cried out to him, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? And Jesus said, Come forth, thy unclean spirit, out of the man. The man means the man's understanding, which is the real man. But this is only a slight glimpse of the meaning of this miracle parable. It refers to a certain state of a man in regard to higher teaching. The point here is that the man cut himself with stones, that is, took higher truth literally and was therefore unclean. And his uncleanness had to pass into the swine. But perhaps we shall be able to understand something more of what this means later on. Jesus always represents the non-literal or non-ritualistic understanding of higher truth. The Jews in the Gospels represent not actual literal people, but a certain literal level of taking everything belonging to higher truth. Everyone is a Jew who cannot get from the sense of the letter to the psychological meaning. So the Jews are said to stone Christ. When Christ said, I and the Father are one, it is said that the Jews took up stones again to stone him, because their literal minds thought his words were blasphemy. The inner meaning is that people on the level of literal and so ritualistic external understanding throw this meaning at people who stand above its level. One can even be stoned by what one once understood in a literal way and now understands quite differently. And one can always stone a man through his actual literal words without allowing any existence what he really meant. And literal law of the legal courts is and must be based on stone, that is, on what you actually said in words and not on what you meant. Part 5. Let us speak for a moment about wine used as an image for truth. We shall study the meaning of esoteric truth when it has reached the stage of wine in a man's understanding later. But at present we must understand that stone is the literal form of esoteric truth and water refers to another way of understanding the same truth and wine to the highest form of understanding it. In the miracle recorded in the second chapter of St John's Gospel, Christ turned water into wine. In this account it is said that he asked the servants to fill the stone jars with water and then he transformed the water into wine. That is, three stages of a man's relation to truth are shown, and this means, of course, three stages in the understanding of esoteric truth. Part 6. The idea of wine leads naturally to the idea of vineyards which produce wine. Before we can continue more fully to the study of the ancient language of parables, we must look at the meaning of vineyards and try to get some idea of their significance. It will be necessary to speak further of this truth that refers to a man's inner development and growth of understanding. This truth is not ordinary truth, it is sown on the earth. For example, 
Christ taught that this particular kind of truth in the Sermon on the Mount, he spoke quite openly about certain aspects of it, but the deeper aspects of it he concealed under the guise of parables. Man cannot invent this truth for himself. We have seen that this is indicated in the story of the Tower of Babel, where men thought they could reach heaven by means of brick and slime instead of stone and mortar. Higher truth, which simply means truth that leads to a higher level of self-evolution, does not arise in life, but comes from those who have already reached this higher level. Many have reached it. Some few of them are recorded in ordinary history. Let us confine ourselves to Christ. He taught this higher truth, but he spoke many things about the establishment of this special order of truth on earth and used the image of a vineyard. A school of teaching based on truth of this order was called by him a vineyard and its object was to produce fruit. If it did not, it was cut down. Christ also speaks of himself as a vine and he says to his disciples, I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same beareth much fruit, for apart from me ye can do nothing. John, chapter 15, verse 5. Christ relates the following parable about a vineyard. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit thereon, and found none. And he said unto the vine dresser, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why doth they also cumber to the ground? And he answering saith unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it, and dung it. And if it bear fruit thenceforth, well, but if not, thou shalt cut it down. Luke, chapter 13, verses 6 to 9. From this point of view, Man was regarded as capable of a special growth, a special inner development, and vineyards were established to make this development possible. Of course, they were not actual vineyards, they were schools of teaching. What did they teach? They taught, first of all, the knowledge that could lead, if practiced, to the higher level of development inherent in man. What they taught a man was that he was an individual, that is, unique, who could reach this higher state of himself, and that this was his real meaning, and that this only could satisfy him most deeply. They began with teaching this truth, or knowledge of this special truth, but they led to something else. They led from truth to a definite state of a man where he acted no longer from the truth that brought him up to this level, but from the level itself. This was sometimes called good. All truth must lead to some good state as its goal. This was the idea belonging to the term vineyard. Wine was produced. A man began to act from good, not truth, thus becoming a new man. The New Man by Maurice Nicole, Chapter 2, The Idea of Temptation in the Gospels, Part 1. As we shall study in the next chapter, the miracle of the transformation of water into wine which in its internal or psychological meaning is about a certain definite stage reached by Jesus in his individual evolution, approximately just before he began to teach. It may be as well to consider the temptations of Jesus and the idea of temptation in its general significance in the Gospels in this connection. Now here it is necessary to grasp clearly something that is not usually understood. What has to be grasped is that Jesus had to undergo inner growth and evolution. He was not born perfect. Had this been the case, he would not have suffered temptation or experienced such despair. Some religious people made a mistake in thinking that Christ had from the start such exceptional powers that anything was possible to him. But, as one instance, Jesus mentions the difficulty of healing a certain form of illness and says that much prayer and fasting is necessary before it can be undertaken. Later on we shall study some of these examples, but it can be said here that the most extraordinary views exist about the unlimited powers that Jesus had on earth, so much so that people even argue that if he were the Son of God, why did he not heal all sickness and convert the whole world? 
This is the same kind of argument used by people who say that if there is a God, why are pain, illness, suffering, war and so on allowed on earth? The whole standpoint of both arguments is wrong. The idea of the meaning of life on earth is not grasped. In fact, the central idea of the Gospels is not grasped, namely the idea of individual evolution and rebirth. Let us repeat the words used above to make the issue of this chapter as clear as possible. Jesus had to undergo inner growth and evolution. Let us start from this point. Jesus was not born perfect as a fully developed, a fully evolved man. On the contrary, he was born imperfect in order to carry out a certain long prophesied task. He had to re-establish at a critical period in human history a connection between the two levels called in the Gospels earth and heaven. And this had to be done in himself practically so as to reopen a way for influences from a higher level of the universe of total being, which extends up through different degrees of the divine being to absolute being, to reach mankind on earth and so make it possible for man to have a possibility of inner development and also for some kind of intelligent culture to exist for a definite period or cycle of history. Of this period, Jesus asked himself whether faith will be found on earth, at its culmination. How be it when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth? Such are the words of Christ, and these words suggest that he doubted whether faith would be found on earth at the end of this cycle. Jesus then had to bridge the human and divine in himself, and in this way re-establish a connection between heaven and earth. He had to undergo all the difficulties of an inner evolution of the human in him, so that it became subject to the higher or divine level. He had to pass through all the stages of this evolution in himself by trial and error until it was perfected through endless inner temptations of which we are only given a few glimpses. And all this took place over a long period about which we only know something of the teaching he gave during the latter part of it which terminated in the final humiliation and so-called catastrophe of the crucifixion and a few details of the earliest part, but nothing of the comparatively long intervening part. Here is silence. We do not know where Jesus was taught during this period, or by whom he was given directions for the final drama he had to enact, the heralding of which was given to John the Baptist, who did not know him by sight, and the ordained culmination of which is referred to by Jesus in many places, and in the miracle of the transformation of water into wine, in the words he is made to say to his mother, Mine hour is not yet come. He does not say mother, but woman. Yet some religious people imagine that Christ was crucified because of Pilate, as it were, by chance. This view is absurd. He had to play the part allotted to him. It was prearranged. Now, in the earliest references to the development of Jesus, it is said that he advanced in wisdom and stature. Jesus advanced by stages. In Luke it is said, The child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was filled with wisdom and grace was upon him. Luke chapter 2 verse 52 Luke, who never saw Jesus, also recalls his first words when he was found in the temple at the age of 12 by his father and mother after a search of three days. His mother is made to say, Son, why have you treated us like this? Do you know your father and I have sought you sorrowing? To which Jesus is made to answer, How is it that you sought me? Do you not know that I must be in all that belongs to my father? Notice that the distinction between father on earth and father in heaven is made. That is between the idea of the first earthly birth and the second higher birth, which was the subject of Christ's teaching. Even at the age of twelve, those who listened to him in the temple were amazed at his understanding and his answers. The idea then of Jesus advancing in understanding is quite distinct. And it is clear that a long period elapsed before he had advanced with full inner stature and attained his supreme development, called in the Gospels the moment of his glorification. This final fulfilment of his evolution began when Judas went out into the night to betray him, as it is called, 
And when Jesus said to his remaining disciples, Now is the Son of Man glorified. But even then it was not yet attained, for he had obviously had to undergo two further and very severe temptations. The temptation in Gethsemane where he prayed, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And the temptation on the cross where he cried out, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Here must also be remarked that Christ began to teach some three years before he attained glorification, that is, before his full development. Let us ask ourselves, how is inner evolution reached? All inner development is possible only through inner temptation. Three temptations of Christ by the devil are mentioned in detail in the early parts of the Gospels of Matthew and Luke and referred to very briefly in Mark in terms of wild beasts. Nothing is said of this in John, but the miracle of water into wine is made as the starting point of the teaching and miracles of Jesus. Let us study for the present the version of the three early temptations as given in Luke, in order to realise that Jesus had to advance by undergoing development by the method of temptation, and so pass through stages of inner growth by means of inner self-conquest. But let us first remember that the conception of mankind in its unawakened state, as given in the Gospels, is that it is in the power of evil, and this is represented by the idea that man is infested by evil spirits. That is, man under the power of evil moods and impulses and faults, which are personified as evil spirits, whose object is the destruction of a man and of the human race. The conception of the Gospels is that man is continually being dragged down by evil forces which are in him, not outside him, and to which he consents. By man's consent to these forces in himself, progress in human life is prevented. The evil powers are in man, in his own nature, in the very nature of his self-love, his egotism, his ignorance, his stupidity, his malice, his vanity, and also his thinking only from the senses, and taking the seen world, the outer appearances of life, as the only reality. These defects are collectively called the devil, which is the name for the terrible power of misunderstanding everything that undeveloped man possesses, the power of wrongly connecting everything. The devil is the aggregate of all these deficiencies, all these powers of misunderstanding in man, and all their transmitted results. So the devil is called the slanderer or scandal maker from one point of view and the accuser from another point of view. But we shall see a little more clearly what is meant by the devil when we begin to understand what temptation really means. In the account of the tempting of Christ by the devil given in Luke, it is said that Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted of the devil. This number 40 appears in the account of the flood where the rain lasted for 40 days and nights. In the allegorical account of the children of Israel wandering 40 years in the wilderness. And it is said also of Moses that he fasted 40 days and nights before he received the commandments written on tablets of stone. Here in Luke, the 40 days in the wilderness are directly connected with the idea of temptation. Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness during 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he did eat nothing in those days, and when they were completed, he hungered. Luke chapter 4 verse 1 to 2. Then comes a description of the first resulting temptation of this period of temptation which is represented in the following way. And the devil said unto him, If thou art the Son of God, command this stone that it becomes a loaf of bread. Luke chapter 4 verse 3. Let us take the superficial literal or first level of meaning. Christ hungered and the devil suggests that he should transform a stone into bread. And Jesus answered and said unto him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Luke 4, verse 4. On the literal level, this is just as it appears, a physical temptation. Notice, however, that it is said above that Jesus was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted of the devil. If we suppose the wilderness to be a literal physical wilderness, how is it that nothing is said about how he was being tempted all this time? 
one might merely say that he was starving. But in connection with inner development, we must understand by the term wilderness a state of mind, a general inner state comparable with a literal wilderness, that is, a state where there is nothing to guide a man, where he is no longer among familiar things and so is in a wilderness, a state of distress and bewilderment and perplexity, where he is left entirely to himself as a test and does not know in which direction to go and must not go in his own direction. This itself is temptation, for all the time he is being starved of meaning. Why should a man leave the familiar and go into the wilderness? He hungers for bread, not literal bread, but that bread that we ask for the Lord's Prayer, so wrongly translated as daily bread, namely guidance, transubstantial bread, and literally bread for the tomorrow. In fact, meaning for the development of our lives, not for our lives as they are today, now, but as they can become, the bread necessary for our support in growing, the bread for successive and necessary stages of understanding. For the Lord's Prayer is a prayer about inner evolution, and the bread asked for is the bread of understanding necessary for it. In such a state, the temptation is to make bread for oneself, that is, to follow one's own ideas, one's own will, exactly as the builders of the Tower of Babel used bricks and slime of their own making in place of stone and water. They thought they could make a new world from their own ideas. Why should not one fall back on oneself and so on life once more instead of waiting for something that seems doubtful? In Matthew, the answer of Christ to this temptation is, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. See clearly that the devil has asked Christ to make bread by himself to ease his state, that is, not to await the word of God. The devil says, If thou art the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. That is, nourish yourself by your own powers and ideas. But the mission of Christ, which began immediately after the temptations in the wilderness, was not to manufacture truth and meaning by himself, but to understand and teach the truth and meaning of the word of God, that is, of a higher level of influences. The test was as to his own self-will and the will of a higher level. He had to do the will of God, not his own will. He had to bring the lower human level in himself under subjection to the will of the higher or divine level. It is the human level here that is under temptation for Jesus was born of a human mother. To mistake the lower for the higher is the annihilation of a man, for then he will ascribe to himself what does not belong to him. A man will then be tempted to say, I am God, and not God is I. If he says, I am God, he identifies himself with God from a lower level. This annihilates him. If he says, God is I, he surrenders his self-will and makes the will of God I in him and so is under and must obey God, that is, a higher level. Notice that the devil is made to address Jesus in the words, If thou art the Son of God, and so suggests that Jesus can do as he likes, as if he were at the level of God. All this was in Jesus, it took place in him. And although this temptation can be taken quite simply as one relative to overcoming the appetites, in this case hunger, it is clear that other and far deeper meanings lie behind the literal meaning and that they are concerned with those problems of self-love and power and violence in which human nature is rooted. Jesus had human nature in him from the woman, his mother. The task was to transform it. This is quite obvious in the second temptation where Christ is offered all power over the visible world. The devil is representing as leading Christ to a high place and showing him all the kingdoms of the world in a point of time. He led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, To thee will I give all this authority and the glory of them, for it hath been delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship before me, it shall be thine. Luke chapter 4 verses 5 to 7 This is temptation as to earthly power and the deep vanity that lies in everyone. It is again directed to the self-love. 
It includes love of the world and its possessions. The devil will give Christ the world. Love of power, authority and love of possessions represent two sides of self-love. Here, the human level in Christ is represented as being subject to the most tremendous temptation conceivable in regard to worldly gain and possessive power. The temptation is described in such a way as to bring this out clearly. The whole world is presented to Jesus in a point of time, that is, simultaneously. Jesus is made to answer, It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That is not the world in its possessions. The answer is from the same ground of understanding as that given in the first temptation. There is something apart from the world and the love of possessing it. There is something else that man must possess. This higher level, both possible to man and already in a man, is the direction in which his desire for power and glory must turn. But even although a man knows and is quite certain about this direction, he can still be tempted, and even more so. Otherwise, Christ would not have been tempted in this way. His human side was still open to this temptation. It is not only the overwhelming effect of the senses and any immediate appeal to self-interest and vanity that has to be thought of here, but perhaps the far subtler ideas of being able, by worldly means and out of power and authority, to help mankind by becoming a king on earth. We know that the disciples thought Jesus was going to be an earthly king, possessing the whole world and give them earthly rewards. They thought from the lower level about higher things. They could not at first see what Jesus was talking about, namely the reaching of a higher or inner level, which has nothing to do with the lower or outer level of life. We must remember here that the path that Christ had to follow led to apparent failure in outer life and outer powerlessness and to a death reserved only for the worst criminals. He had only a few ultimate followers. It looked as if everything had been useless. Certainly we cannot expect to understand this unless we grasp the whole idea of two levels. But we shall speak more of this later on, and only say here that temptation in the real sense is about these two levels and relates to the passage from one to the other. If Jesus had been born perfect, he would have been beyond all temptation. He would not have represented the new man or the way to it. He called himself the way. I am the way for this reason. Part two. There are different ways in which we can be tempted and different ways in which we can yield to temptation. Let us speak of temptation in general. All temptation, if it is real, implies a struggle between two things in a man, each of which aims at getting control. This struggle has two forms. It is always either between what is true and what is false, or between what is good and what is bad. The whole inner drama of man's life and the result of it all, in terms of his inner development, lies in this inner struggle about what is the truth and what is a lie, and what is good and what is bad. And actually it is about these things that everyone is always thinking and wondering in the privacy of his mind and heart. The mind is for thinking what is true and the heart for perceiving what is good. Let us take first temptation in regard to truth. This takes place in the intellectual life of a person. Everyone holds to certain things he regards as true. Knowledge itself is not truth, for we know many things but do not regard all of them as necessarily true or we are indifferent to them. But out of all the things we know, some we hold to be true. This is our personal truth, and it belongs to our personal intellectual life, for knowledge and truth are of the mind. Now the intellectual life of a man is nothing but what he believes to be true, and when this is assailed in any way, he feels anxiety. The more he values what he believes to be true, the more anxiety will he feel when doubt enters his mind. This is a mild state of temptation in which a man must think about what he believes and values as truth and from it fight with his doubts. You must understand that no one could be tempted about what he does not value. It is only in connection with what he values that he can be tempted. 
The meaning of temptation is to strengthen all that a man values as truth. Throughout the Gospels, the idea that a man must struggle and fight in himself is apparent. The Gospels are about the inner development and evolution of a man. This demands inner struggle, that is, temptation is necessary. But people are sometimes offended at the idea that they must fight for truth and must go through temptations in regard to it. But it is necessary to fight for knowledge as much as to fight with oneself. Now let us take temptation in regard to good. This is not intellectual but emotional. It belongs to the side that a man wills, not what he thinks. The basis of what a man wills is what he feels is good. Everyone wills and acts from what he feels is good, and all that a man wills belongs to his voluntary life. Nothing else makes the voluntary life of a man but that which he is impressed upon himself as being good. If all that a man holds as good were taken away from him, his voluntary life would cease, just as if all that a man believes to be truth were taken away from him, his intellectual life would cease. Now in the Gospels all truth has to do with knowledge of the teaching given by Christ and all good has to do with the love of God and the love of one's neighbour. Now whatever a man loves he regards as good and what he regards as good he wills and acts from. If he only loves himself then he is a man to whom good means only his own good and anything that does not apply to his own good he will regard as bad. The development of the will is through the development of the love and the development of the love is at the expense of the self-love. Now since a man can only be tempted intellectually through what he values as truth, he can only be tempted in regard to his will and deeds through what he loves. And since all temptation in a real sense is about the truth of the word, that is the teaching of the gospels and the good of the word, temptation as to good as distinct from truth, only begins when a man begins to pass beyond the level of self-love into what is called charity or love of neighbour through a sense of the existence of God as the source of love. Temptations as to truth necessarily begin long before temptations as to good, but if there is no sort of natural charity in a man, his temptations as to truth will be less easy to pass through. Truth must enter and grow in a man first before he can change the direction of his will, that is, before his feeling of what is good can change. When he begins to feel the feeling of new good entering him, the two feelings will alternate. Later he will feel a struggle between the new good and what he formerly felt as good. But by this time he should be able to hold on to truth, however he fouls in regard to good. The man is really between two levels, lower and upper, and all world temptation only begins when this is the case. For the lower level attracts him and he has to find a path between them. Actually he lifts himself up a little and falls back like a drunken man trying to get off the floor. But if temptation as to good really begins, whatever it results in, at any time, he must never let failure or apparent failure war against the truth on to which he is holding. If he does, he will lose some sense of truth with each failure. Whatever he is or does, he must hold to the truth he has received and keep it alive in him. Part 3. In the third temptation of Christ, the devil once more begins by saying, If thou art the Son of God, we must understand that Christ had to fight against self-love in all its forms and all kinds of earthly loves and everything derived from them. He had to overcome every feeling of self-power rising from the human level in him so as to make it subject to the higher level. Now temptation in a real sense has to do with the relation of the lower level in a man to any higher possible level. Bear in mind that the central idea in the Gospels is that a man should pass from a lower to a higher state and that this is in an evolution or rebirth. Since the Word of God is teaching about the means necessary for this inner evolution, all intellectual temptation in the Gospels refers to a man's private thoughts about the truth of the word and the truth of the senses and all emotional temptation is about self-love and the love of God. There is, naturally, disagreement between the lower and the higher level just as we might say there is disagreement between a seed and a plant. We might say that a seed can live for itself and be full of its self-love or it can surrender itself and its self-will to the higher influences that seek to operate on it 
so that it becomes by transformation a plant. The third temptation is given in these words in Luke. And he led him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou art the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, to guard thee, and on their hands they shall bear thee up, lest haply thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Luke chapter 4 verses 9 to 12 It can be understood that the self-love necessarily only worships itself. So it can and actually does ascribe divineness to itself. That is, the lower imagines it is the higher and so tempts God. It cannot feel its own nothingness and so swells itself up to heaven. And then in the intoxication of its own divinity, in the madness of self-illusion, it may attempt the impossible and destroy itself. In the account of the temptation by the devil, it is said that Christ was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. In Luke, he was led by the Spirit in the wilderness during 40 days being tempted of the devil. In Mark, the expression is stronger. And straightway the Spirit driveth him forth into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and he was with the wild beasts. Mark chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. In Matthew, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. The temptations in the wilderness, in each gospel where they are described, are made to follow on the baptism of Jesus by John. It seems strange that Christ should be led into temptation by the very spirit of inner illumination with which he was filled. But Christ taught that a man must be born again of the spirit and without temptation there is no transformation. The spirit is the connecting medium between higher and lower. The human in Christ had to be transformed and lifted up to the divine level. And since the spirit is the intermediary, drawing the lower by a series of transformations to the higher, the work of the Spirit is to lead a man into the wilderness, nay, rather into utter bewilderment, and subject him to being tempted by every element in himself, so that all that is useless for his self-evolution is put behind him, and all that can grow and understand is put in front. The devil represents all in a man that cannot evolve, and all that does not wish to and hates every idea of inner evolution, all that wishes only to slander and misunderstand and have its own way. All this must gradually be put behind a man who seeks real inner development and not allowed to take the first place and control him. That is, the order of things in a man must change and what is first become last. So in one of the accounts, Christ is made to say to the devil, Get thee behind me, Satan! That this new inner order in a man which is brought about by temptation cannot take place at once is clear from Luke's words, where she said that the temptations of Christ were not ended. The devil, it is said, departed from him for a season. The New Man by Maurice Nicole, Chapter 3, The Marriage at Cana Between whom was the marriage? Notice nothing is said about the bride and groom. Jesus and his mother surely are externally represented by mother and son, understood psychologically it is about an internal union of natural and spiritual in Jesus. Why then does not the master of the feast realise what has taken place? Why was it impossible for him to understand, so much so that the servants did not attempt to inform him, although technically the servants were presumably under the orders of the master of the feast? Because a new master has appeared, almost secretly, and notice that this new master does not say anything to the master of the feast, whom we may term the old master. When man changes his whole psychology in such a profound way, the former master of it is no longer in control, but another and greater master appears. By self-mastery as regards the natural side of him represented by the mother, Jesus reached a stage in which the old master had no longer any power and yet did not know what had happened. Jesus is not master of the feast, but no one tells the former master what has taken place. They are all silent. There is no rivalry, only silence. 
A transformation has taken place, actually in terms of water into wine, but nothing happened through violence. In all the miracles of Jesus, there was never violence or rivalry. There was, in place, silence. Jesus told Pilate that if necessary, he, Jesus, could call powers into action that would bring about his release, but he did not use them. Violence breeds violence. And it is a strange line of thought that leads to reflection upon what is mastery in oneself and how to overcome, or rather to turn aside from it. Nothing must be said to antagonise and inflame it. Even Pilate could see a little about Jesus, and the master of the feast could appreciate a good wine. But no doubt the latter would have been a difficult factor to handle if the miracle had been explained by his servants and the master's authority disputed. There are many things said in the Gospels about this inner silence in connection with changing oneself. Silence in oneself is required. Let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Matthew chapter 6 verse 3 One does not overcome earthly authority by reacting violently to it. A man may react violently to his father. How many throw away their best side in violently opposing authority? They even become what they hate in time. Inner change is not gained in this way, but here, in this symbolic ma marriage, the authority of the mother of Jesus is not represented in terms of reaction, but as a bringing about of some inner ordering, whereby her significance is not destroyed but used aright because it is she who makes it possible for the miracle to take place by telling the servants to obey what Jesus told them to do. And since he derived from her his human or natural side, it seems clear that, at this stage of his development, he has brought the human or natural side in him into a right relation with the greater or spiritual side, and so she obeyed him. There are disciplines where this natural side is taken as something to be overcome entirely and only spiritual fault far above the earthly side is allowed. This cutting in half of a man or woman cannot be regarded as an ordering or harmony of all the notes that sound in our being. Jesus, on his mother's side, was born a man. His task was to connect man with God, the natural with the spiritual, and not to cut asunder into opposites, what are not opposites at all, but different levels and scales. Now the natural side of a man and the more internal side, or relatively spiritual side, might similarly be represented by two figures, or by two rooms, one opening into the other, or by two heights, lower and higher, or by two towns, or in many other ways. The visual imagery by itself is nothing. The significance is everything, for there lies the meaning. It is not the visual imagery in a parable that means what the parable means. It is not words used in a parable that mean what the parable means. Some dreams are pure parables, as are some ancient myths and stories. But it is the meaning that such parables, myths, dreams, fairy stories conduct that is the significant thing. To the natural level of mind they appear without meaning, save a literal one. But the spiritual, the psychological meaning, cannot be conveyed directly in words to the natural level. And this is why another language has always existed. A verbal language can only be understood by those familiar with it. But a parable in visual representation can be understood by people not speaking the same verbal language. There are two languages. They correspond to two depths or levels in man. Now there is a term used in esoteric language which always signifies that a certain development has been fulfilled. This term is numerical. The number three implies fulfilment. In this sign of water into wine, it is said at the beginning that on the third day there was a marriage. The beginning, middle and end form the completion of a stage. So in esoteric language, the number three is the end of something and the beginning of something else. When a psychological stage is being fulfilled, a new state begins. This is the third day. The old is passing away, the new state beginning. Or, 
the higher level is beginning to be active and the formal level is beginning to obey this new higher level. The number three is used to represent this situation as, for example, when Christ fulfilled his necessary time in hell and rose on the third day. There are many examples of this use of the number three in the esoteric books of the Bible. Jonah was three days in the belly of the great fish. Peter denies Christ three times, that is, fully. Christ asked Peter three times if he loves him. The fig tree that did not bear fruit for three years was to be cut down. There are many other examples of the use of the number three as meaning fulfilment, either fulfilment in the sense of a new beginning or fulfilment as the completion of a thing. Now the whole sign of water into wine is about a stage that Jesus had reached in the development of his human side. So it begins with the third day. And the following is from John chapter 2 verses 1 to 11. And upon the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And all Jesus was also was bidden, and his disciples to the marriage. And when the wine fouled, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Now there were six water pots of stone set there after the Jews' manner of purifying, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the ruler of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast tasted the water now become wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which had drawn the water knew, the ruler of the feast called on the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man setteth on the first good wine, and when men have drunk freely, then that which is worse, thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed on him. John chapter 2 verses 1 to 11. Notice that the mother of Jesus is present, representing his former level, with which he is still in contact, but he has nothing to do with it. To the former level of himself he says, Woman, what have I to do with thee? To understand his rough attitude towards his mother, it is necessary to look at some other passages in the Gospel. Let us suppose a man reaches a level at which self-pity, all that is pathetic in him, has been destroyed. Many people regard Christ as a pathetic figure, a sick Christ. This conception of Christ usually goes with the view that he was brutally treated and dragged to the cross. Of course, everything in the Gospel shows quite the opposite. The Gospels show that he deliberately suffered on the cross. He predicted his crucifixion. He told his disciples that he had to undergo this fulfilment of his end. And although he prayed in the agony at Gethsemane that this end might be altered, Calling it a cup that he must drink, he said, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. To take him as a pathetic figure is beside the point. The sentimental Christ is an invention. It is obvious that he was harsh in his handling of others, many of whom he offended, and he was harsh with himself. In the scene with Pilate, it is shown that if he followed his own will, he could escape. He says to Pilate, Thou couldst have no power over me except it were given thee from above. John chapter 19 verse 11. But he deliberately plays the role allotted to him and carries it out because this was the aim that was set him to fulfil, as he so often explained. The disciples did not understand and only later some of them grasped the idea of the whole drama of Christ enacted visibly before them namely the inevitable crucifixion of a higher level of truth at the hands of those on a lower level. The destruction of psychological truth by literal truth is the continual drama of human life. Jesus says to his mother, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. This suggests that eventually he will be destroyed by what the mother represents in humanity. 
We must get entirely away from any literal sense, even from any actual figure. Jesus had reached a point in his own evolution and temptation where the mother level scarcely has anything to do with him. That is, some level typified by the mother, whom he calls woman. It no longer has power and yet still has power but is subordinate. So Jesus changes water into wine and so he gives the first sign of the level of inner development that he has reached. The two ideas are connected. The raising of himself from the mother level and the resulting power of turning water into wine. But it is clear from the account of the marriage feast, which is a psychological portrait, that although Jesus had reached this new stage, in which he had nothing more to do with his former state, yet the former state is close beneath him and still can take power. He controls it so that the mother understands that obedience is necessary. So she orders the servants to obey what Jesus commands. Three levels in Jesus are thus depicted. The lowest is represented by the servants who obey the mother. The middle by the mother. The highest by the new level or state of Jesus where the mother obeys. Let us conceive these three states as three horizontal lines drawn one above the other in parallel. The middle line will then represent the intermediary between the highest and lowest lines. In other words, some definite order of levels is indicated, highest, middle and lowest. This state, attained by Jesus and marking the beginning of his power of teaching, is defined by the general setting of the psychological portrait in terms of a marriage, that is, some inner union, totally different from the mother-son union, and its consequences, the turning of water into wine. What is meant in this psychological description by the idea of a marriage? What element in Jesus had come into union with some other element, with the result that water became wine and so gave the first sign of his inner evolution? In the Bible, the first truths concerning our existence and what we have to do, that is, the commandments, were written on tables of stone, as we are told. But we must recall that something apparently went wrong in the transmission of these truths from God to Moses. Moses cast down the original tables, written by God, and smashed them, when he found that in his absence on Mount Sinai, his people had begun to worship a golden calf that they had set up. The following is from Exodus 32, verses 15, 16, 19. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, with the two tables of the testimony in his hand, tables that were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, craven upon the tables. And he came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. Then Moses was commanded by God to make two more tables of stone with his own hands, and he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. Exodus 34, verse 4. All truth coming from those who are at a far higher level of the understanding of it than we are cannot be transmitted directly. We have nothing with which to receive it, and so occupy ourselves with our level of understanding truth with legal agreements, forms and so on. Higher truth therefore reaches us in terms of lower, rigid, literal truth. It is adults speaking to children. It is impossible to convey the full meaning. Just as the Ten Commandments had to be represented on stone tables so that the children of Israel could receive them, so the already existing truth, the water in this parable, is described as poured into six water pots of stone, those used for the Jewish rites of purification. This suggests that the truth was based on the ancient Jewish beliefs and customs. Six is in ancient allegory the number of creation or, on different levels, the number of preparation for any achievement. For six days in the week we prepare for the Sabbath. A Jewish servant had to serve for six years before he won his freedom. A vineyard had to be pruned for six years. The land had to be sown for six years. But the seventh year was always a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land. Such was the law given to Moses. 
Likewise, there were six steps up to the throne of Solomon. Thus, the six water pots of stone would appear to stand for a period of preparation during which the truth as water had been received and held in the minds of the Jews and had taken a form corresponding to that ancient faith, awaiting in transformation at the coming of Christ. Now, in this parable, water, after having been poured into stone jugs, becomes wine. Let us recall what has been said already about these three stages of truth, stone, water, wine. Stone represents literal truth and we can conceivably understand that successive transformations of meaning are implied in these different levels of truth. What we are taught at our mother's knee may be truth, but it is not our own even though we obey it. God is a spirit, the mother is not. The authority is not yet internal, but has come from outside. It is said elsewhere that Jesus taught us one having authority, but even this seeing the truth of truth is not sufficient and not only meant here. A further stage is meant and we must seek for the word good in order to gain an idea of the meaning. Stone, water, wine indicate three levels of truth, but where can we find any word comparable to good? We find it at the end of this dynamic portrait. The ruler of the feast, tasting the water made into wine, remarks that the usual custom of the world at a marriage feast is to give the good wine first and the poorer afterwards. He was speaking literally. And when the ruler of the feast tasted the water now become wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which had drawn the water knew, the ruler of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man setteth on first the good wine, and when men have drunk free than that which is worst, thou hast kept the good wine until now. Now the mother had told the servants to obey Christ. Let us notice that the servants knew, and the mother knew that he had been ordered to pour water into the empty stone jars. They had access to the water, that is, the part of Jesus, that was at the level of understanding. He used that lower level, not directly. He used it through the intermediary middle level, called mother. Here we have real psychology, something long ago lost. But the whole mind must be abstracted from the senses, the level of literal meaning, to catch a single flash from the brilliance of inner psychological meaning in this first sign of the inner development of Jesus, recorded in terms of a visible imagery, palpably false. Consider only if these visible images meant what they stand for literally. Then why did Jesus transform about 120 gallons of water into wine, as we are told? In a small village, such as Cana of Galilee was, this would be absurd. It cannot mean that so much water was miraculously made into wine, equal to some 600 litres, towards the end of a local festival. But it is exactly through seeing that the meaning cannot be literal that we can begin to look for another meaning that is psychological. The representation of the psychological in terms of physical images, as in cartoons, is one thing, but the taking of psychological meaning in terms of the physical is a reverse process that continually occurs in every attempt to convey higher meaning. So Christ, the psychological meaning, is always crucified by those who only can take in literal, sense-based meaning. A sense-based mind believes that the bread and wine used in the ritual of the commemoration of the Last Supper are to be taken literally. But the literal level of comprehension in such high matters plays havoc with us and has done so throughout the ages. A man may take the phrase, Thou shalt not kill, literally, and obey it as such. But if he sees more deeply and understands that he may be killing others psychologically all day in his thoughts and feelings, he will begin to pass on to another level of the understanding of this injunction and realise the fuller or more internal meaning of it. Then what he has been taught outwardly begins to penetrate him and its meaning undergoes an inner transformation comparable at first to stone into water and eventually when he realises the good contained in the command and so has compassion, which is of goodness, to water into wine. 
through this insight, he will evolve in himself, in his understanding. Individual evolution is only possible by transformation of the understanding, a man being his understanding, and what he wills from it, and nothing more. A man is not physical. Only psychologically can anyone individually evolve in the sense of the Gospels. Once a man has seen for himself the value of what he has been taught as mere command or outer truth, once the emotional side of him has developed up to whatever knowledge of truth he has, so that he seeks to do what he knows from his own willing and feeling and consent, he is then another kind of man, an evolving man, a man reaching the stage that we are taking at present as wine, a new man. One of the deepest teachings of esotericism deals with the union of the two sides of a man. In the esoteric teaching of the Greeks exemplified by Socrates, this idea runs through the whole exposition of man as an unfinished creation of a possible higher state of himself. Plato calls these two sides knowledge and being. He says, the true lover of knowledge is always striving after being. And this was written in the Republic. And again he says, when it, the soul, is stayed upon that on which truth and being are shining, it understands and knows and is seen to have reason. This, then, which imparts truth to the things that are known and the power of knowing to the knower, is what I would have you term the idea of good. The good may be said to be not only the author of knowledge of all things known, but of their being and essence. From the Republic. A man must have being in order to know rightly. The education of being and the education of knowledge was Plato's greatest theme in his later books. How to bring up people rightly and how to give them knowledge and at what time to give them knowledge. This was the problem with which he was continually occupied. To give poor types of people knowledge that they will only misuse was one thing that Plato saw clearly as a great danger. To open knowledge of whatever kind to everyone was to him a crime. He saw clearly that many disciplines must be undergone referring to character and being before a man was fit to be taught knowledge. In fact, he came to the conclusion that for anyone to be taught great knowledge, he must have been trained in all the exercises and disciplines of life until he had become of an age that was no longer that of youth. In the esoteric schools of which we can see traces in ancient literature, many very severe disciplines existed before a candidate was allowed to receive esoteric knowledge. He might have to serve in a most menial position for years, subject to insults that were a test on the side of being. If he passed these tests successfully and developed in himself strength and patience, he was allowed to receive some knowledge. But if he broke, if he pitied himself, if he complained, if he was weak in his being, if he lied, if he behaved maliciously, if he took advantage of others, if he was resentful, if he thought he was better than other people, he received no knowledge. This means that the side of his being was tested first before he was given knowledge. Today the situation is quite different. Anyone is given knowledge without discrimination and there is a growing class of literature calling attention to this point without the idea of the development of being as a primary factor being quite understood. For a man to receive higher knowledge, he must have good being to make salt in him. If we regard knowledge as chlorine and being as sodium, then unless a man has enough sodium in him to combine with the chlorine he receives from outside, he will not have salt in him. Then the chlorine poisons him. The poisonous power of knowledge alone, without the good ground of which the gospel so often speak to receive it, may simply produce world poison. In such a case, the acquiring of knowledge can only produce the worst results. But the mystery is deeper than this. The esoteric teaching about knowledge and being refers to the fact that knowledge cannot be understood unless there is a corresponding development of being. A man may know a great deal and understand nothing because his being is not equal to his knowledge. As a consequence, no inner union can take place between his being and his knowledge. We see today an extraordinary number of books full of knowledge but with no understanding. We see the cheapest explanations given of the facts of science. 
The man of poor being and great knowledge can only give out meaningless material that leads nowhere. And not only this, but he can only complicate everything and make it unintelligible. And so science today complicates everything too much and apparently leads nowhere. Countless scientists are writing papers that no one understands, not even the scientists. The reason for this is that the conditions of knowledge are no longer understood because the side of being is ignored. Esotericism has always understood the conditions of knowledge. It has always understood that knowledge should always lead to understanding and that understanding is only possible with a corresponding development of being. This is the deepest idea concerning human psychology for then a union takes place that leads to inner evolution. In this marriage or union, the meaning of the knowledge unites with the being of the person and leads to his inner development. This is what the parable of water made into wine is all about. It means that Christ united his knowledge with the good of his being. His knowledge and the goodness of his being become one. Let us repeat what has already been pointed out, that the ruler of the feast speaks about the good wine and that the good came last. First of all, a man must be taught truth or knowledge and then the goodness of it comes later. Actually, however, good must also precede knowledge, but of this we will speak later. What is good is prior to all truth, but in time it seems as if knowledge comes first. The ultimate aim in life is the good. If we say that at the summit of things is good, then it is prior to everything else and so is first in scale. But in time it looks as if knowledge comes first. All knowledge should lead to good. Therefore good is first in scale, although to our senses, which are in time, and only see a cross-section of all existence called the present moment, it looks the other way round. The man without a wedding garment reaches the kingdom of heaven. Yes, he goes upstairs and should not. By what means? By cleverly pretending. The parable is related in Matthew. And the following is Matthew, chapter 22, verses 2 to 14. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, which made a marriage feast for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that that were bidden to the marriage feast, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them that are bidden, Behold, I have made ready my dinner, my oxen and fattenings are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the marriage feast. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his merchandise, and the rest laid hold on his servants, and entreated them shamefully and killed them, but the king was wroth, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they that were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore unto the partings of the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage feast. And those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was filled with guests. But when the king came in to behold the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment, and he saith unto him, Friend, how comest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him out into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Who were the guests? Notice that those guests were found at the parting of the highways. One of them is without a wedding garment. A man reaches a certain understanding. Up to a certain point he understands. Is he going to follow what he understands? He comes to the parting of the ways. He is taken in intellectually what he has been taught because to reach the parting of the ways he must have received some teaching. He may have preached swayed thousands by his rhetoric? Did he believe internally what he taught externally? This man without a wedding garment has no intention of believing in what he has said. No doubt he appears good, kind, long-suffering, charitable. He uses the right words. He deceives everyone. He can ape any of the virtues. 
but interiorly he believes nothing. It is all out of show. Coming into the strong light of those far more conscious than himself, he ceases to deceive. His inner lack of belief is seen. Internally he is naked. A wedding garment signifies desire for union. To be wed is to unite with what is beyond you, not yourself. This can only come from the inner man in you. This man is all self and show and reputation. All he does is self. He loves no one but himself and so has no inner side. The highest in himself is himself, but he acts well. He is an actor, a hypocrite. Outwardly, he seems to believe what he says. Inwardly, he believes nothing. So inwardly, he has no wedding garment. He does not wish his being to wed with what he teaches. Coming to those whose vision can penetrate out of pretense, he clearly has no wedding garment. He has no desire to unite with what he teaches. Why? Because he has nothing of goodness in him. Even if what he teaches is truth, he will not marry it.